Hello, I'm Dr. Evelyn Nelson Weaver, and I'll be your guide as we unpack a literature review for EDU 683 with Southern New Hampshire University. First, I would like to remind you of some basics. Number one, no running head should be used in student papers according to APA Style 7th edition. Also, page number should be in the upper right-hand corner and begin on the title page. Please follow the example of a title page found in the course announcements. Another reminder, there should be no personal pronouns in the literature review. All right, let's get started. You see that this is by a student, and I have called her a perfect copy. <laughs> it's not perfect, but it comes very close. The reason that this looks a little bit different than some of the other literature reviews that you have seen is because I made sure that all of the elements that are required in the rubric are met in this format. And that's why it is so important that you use this format so that you don't skip any of those many, many, many different elements of the rubric. So first off, you are going to support your achievement gap. You need to have a very clear achievement gap statement. This needs to include an academic subject area and a grade level. And this will be necessary as you design your curriculum plan. This student has included three or four paragraphs. I'm not saying that that is necessary, but this is kind of an introduction and a lot of you have been wanting to write an introduction, so this is your chance. Do not give it all away, though, because you still have to write a long paragraph on every one of your sources, much like you did in the annotated bibliography. So when you give the achievement gap, make it a very clear statement, and then quote or paraphrase a few of the authors, but do not repeat this information anywhere in the rest of this document. All information needs to be clear and not repeated. All right, you'll notice that she is using the last names of the authors. We see that right here. And then she is going to put in the publication date, and then this is a quote. So you have the quote here, end it with close quote, and then put the page with a period. This is the correct format when you are quoting material from another source. And please notice that there, most of these have no more than one quote within a paragraph. It's, it's a good key to keep in mind. All right, let's go on and move down. Here we go, I think I'm moving down. There we go, all righty. The next section is the context. Most of you did well on this in the annotated bibliography. This is the same thing, except that you have to include all eight to 10 sources that are required in the literature review. So make sure you add more to this. And in this section, this is really important, you need not to generalize about the sources. You need to describe the kind of sources used in this review. You're going to answer questions like, were they research studies? 
If so, what kind and how many participants were involved? What were the ages and or ethnicity of the students? What is, was it a compilation of research studies or just research about a particular subject? And what were the sources for their data? Now you can see that we start off here, <clears throat> excuse me, by Henry et al. And he collected and analyzed data from a diverse group of participants from across the United States. Olson focused their study on writing skills of white, Latino, and ELL students in California. So this is what they wrote about, but it also tells us the specifics here. And then they go on to say their analysis of pre- and post-test scores show cognitive writing strategies are an effective way to address the achievement gap between white and minority students. So give us just a short glimpse as to what they did and what they came up with. This doesn't have to have a lot of the conclusions, but we need to make sure that the reader understands the philosophy and the ways that these people were able to collect their data. So that's all this context is. How did they collect the data and how did they present it? Now this is a very good sentence. Bird uses the lens of a cultural difference model to analyze various strategies can be used to address the achievement gap, et cetera, et cetera. So some of this rhetoric can come from the source. Now, of course, you have to paraphrase it. And if you don't, then you have to put it into quotes. But there is a section in every study that says how they received or collected their data. And that's very important. Now, once in a while, not very often, I hope, you might use someone's teaching experience. Perhaps they have written uh, a dissertation or even published a, a book or some active research study. So here, this author says, Thomas, 2019, draws upon her teaching experience in elementary school classrooms to demonstrate how the use of diverse texts that paint minority students in a positive light can result in cre increased reading motivation, etc. Do not use these authors very often. Um, if they are renowned for writing books on the subject, that's fine. But it's very hard to justify and prove uh, their worth to the community and to this body of literature when they have just been a classroom teacher. And of course, being a classroom teacher, I don't mean to belittle it, but I do know that those who have dedicated their career to research often have more prestige with other people as they are reading the material in your literature review. Because remember, this is not particularly for you. This is written for the people who want to see where did you find your information. Okay, so the next section, the summary of uh, findings. Now, this is not a conclusion. This, again, is a summary of each of your sources. This is the meat of the literature review. You want to make sure each one of your authors receive an adequate reporting. And I would say a long paragraph for each one would be a very good guide. This is where you really get to talk about just what that particular source said, not any of your personal opinions. Remember, no personal opinions. You are just reporting the facts, okay? All right, so 
sometimes she quotes um, and lists the title. This is not necessary. However, if you do feel like you just have to tell us what the title is, go ahead and put it in italics. And then, of course, you need to still say who wrote it. So there's Henry at all, and then the date. Very important that every time you mention a journal or the name of the article, that you put that in italics. It'll save you a lot of wear and tear if you'll do that. All righty. So here she goes down and uh, talks about Henry et al. And then similarly, she brings in the new author because they agree. So because she's presenting this according to their ideas and their conclusions, she can put two in this paragraph. But you notice that it takes up an entire page. All right, and then the next one, she goes on and introduces Mayfield and Garrison. Again, she has one quote in this section, and it is quoted correctly. So please notice that. All right, here's her third paragraph. And look at how she transitions from one paragraph to another. Another outside factor that has had significant influence. So she doesn't just jump into it like you did in your, in, uh, your annotated bibliography. There are these transition words from one paragraph to the other. Because this is a narrative. You are telling your reader, your prospective buyer for your curriculum, where you got your information, what it says, and why is it important to bridging the gap. This is where you are supporting all of the strategies you're going to use in your curriculum. They're not just going to look at your curriculum. They're going to look at all of this information. Did you find that other authors support what you have put into your curriculum? That's what this is all about. So it's very, very important that this is the main focus of the entire literature review. All right, so we have unpacked this section with author after author, a few quotes, and we are finished with all eight or ten of these. See, all of this has been in the summary. And now we come to the conclusion. Here's where you draw upon all the information, but this is kind of the down and dirty. Now this is where you're going to really say, these were the ones that I think were the best. Of course, you're not going to use personal pronouns. So let's just read a, a little bit of this. A few essential conclusions can be drawn about the achievement gap between white and minority students from the provided research. This specific achievement gap can be overwhelming in its complexity, making it quite difficult to address. All right, excellent introduction. Then she begins the support. Don't just give us your opinions here. Go back. It's support, support, support. Henry et al. and Rojas Lebu and Slate identify family socioeconomic statuses as a likely cause of the achievement gap. Great, great sentence. Two authors already discussed. Because they are more likely to come from disadvantaged homes with lower levels of income, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This can lead to a slower rate of reading growth. Marvelous. In just three sentences, she summed everything up with those two authors. Then she keeps going. Racial bias, as discussed by Mayfield and Garrison Wade, as well as the ones that she just mentioned, also contributes to this achievement gap. The preconceived notion 
educators hold in relation to minority students significantly affects the quality of the education students receive, as well as their ability to access rigorous coursework and learning opportunities. All right, this is great that she has already reviewed and summed up three of her studies. Then she goes on continuing, well-intentioned government initiatives. I love that because she is just putting it out there, kind of some of her bias, and yet she's going to support it right here. And she didn't, she wasn't negative when she made this comment. They're well-intentioned government initiatives, such as Common Core, also contribute to the persistent achievement gap. All right. This is very good writing. It would behoove you to take time to read all of her writing so that you get a feel for what needs to happen in this section. All right. Here we go. The last paragraph now in the conclusions. While there is no one right way to close the gap between white and minority students, the implementation of culturally responsive teaching is one of the most effective practices. Now, she doesn't just leave it there. She discusses and supports it with Byrd and Collagen and Sappington. And down here, she gives us two more. That's an excellent closing statement. And please notice that the only sources you are allowed to quote in this conclusion have to be the ones used in the summary. All right, I know sometimes you have problems with that. All right, the definition of key constructs. Now, this is no more than what we did with the key words in your annotated bibliography. The key constructs stem from the search phrases or main ideas that helped you develop your project. And all you have to do here, don't give me any more. She even gave me a little bit too much, but I'll take it. Just define the keywords and phrases. So she, she lists them here. She says, in search of resources to identify the causes and best practices to address the achievement gap, the following key constructs were utilized, colon, and then she lists them. White and minority students, comma, racial achievement gap, comma. Then she goes on to define each one of these terms, but she does it in a way that is easy for you to read. Much of the initially identified research found that family socioeconomic status factors such as income and parental education are a good indicator of student achievement, causing a gap between disadvantaged minority students and their white peers. And it was cited in these two different sources. And that's why we need to have that. That's very important. So take each one of those and define them or show how they were used in the literature. Very important. Okay, the evaluation. Now, sometimes this is a little confusing. Uh, in this section, first of all, you should not restate anything you wrote in the context section. Here, you should provide examples of how the sources are relevant to the achievement gap and how they were evaluated for credibility. All right. Now, when we talk about credibility, we're talking about the author's credibility. You need to be specific about naming the authors, authors and presenting their qualifications to address the achievement gap. You can discuss their contributions to the field. They've written four books on the subject. You don't need to tell us all the names, but you can say they wrote four books on the subject. That would get my attention. Um, you can also say that the journal, you don't have to list the journal, but you can say that journal was supported by and tell us the organization. Look down here what she says. 
The study conducted by Olson on the writing achievement gap between Latino and white students was funded by the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Language Acquisition, and published by the APA. I mean, that's good prestige right there. That is what you are looking for. You want to give us things that are first traceable. Don't just say they're well known. Tell us why. Tell us how. Here's another good sentence. Adding to the credibility of their work are the extensive writings the authors previously published on academic writing for secondary and ELL students. I would say that's a good introduction, but then list the author and what they wrote if they've only written one. Try not to generalize. Try to be very specific. Uh, Mabalia, the founder of the Literacy for Brown Girls program, is a credible source in that she has extensively researched the neglect of black girls in K-12 schools. This is excellent. That's a very good. This last sentence, the last paragraph is very good. The kind of things we're looking for. Not everyone will read this, but a good administrator who's looking for a well-supported curriculum will come look and find out what the evaluation was all about in this literature review. All right, the final one, application of ethics and cultural competency. You in this section, you need to discuss how the research studies were conducted in an ethical and honest manner. This is not that they themselves are ethical or it's not the content that they wrote about uh, students from every cultural area. This is not content here. This is simply proving that they were fair in their studies. Or if they just gathered studies, they made sure that the studies that they gathered represented uh, an overview of the population. So let's just read through some of this. All right, she says, the central focus of research was to identify the causes of the achievement gap between white and minority students, as well as potential strategies that can be implemented to reduce the gap. All of the reviewed research was conducted in both an ethical and culturally competent manner. That's fine as an introduction, but if you stop there, you're not going to get credit for having what's supposed to be here. It says each of the studies include individual students, etc. The names of participants are kept confidential. The data collected in the studies is labeled in a more general way. Now comes the specifics, and this is what I want to make sure that you include. I can get back up to these things. There we go. All right. Here. In their study of using cognitive writing, strategies to reduce the achievement gap between Latino and white students. Olson include a student writing sample and made sure to change the name of the student so her privacy is protected. That's the kind of thing I want to hear here. Very important. According to Bird, due to the changes in U.S. demographics, cultural competence will allow for an enhancement of instruction by acknowledging student differences. So this was written in Bird's study because she quoted it. So we know that they are going to be culturally competent. All right, let's go on a little bit further. All the identified research will allow for the creation of an ethical and culturally competent curriculum. This is the second part of what has to go in this section. This is where you will discuss the ways that you will keep the curriculum equitable for all students. Now notice, you still cannot use the personal 
pronoun. So don't say, when I write, don't do that. Do something like she did, because this is the way to do it. Okay, if I can get back to my writing tools. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, all the identified research will allow for, good little sentence there, the creation of an ethical and culturally competent curriculum, one that creates reading and writing experiences that allow students to explore and celebrate their diversity. Now, I would like a few more sentences about that as to how you're going to do that. But notice the type of writing. She is not using personal pronouns, and yet she has told us what is going to go into that curriculum. And finally, with an understanding of the factors that cause the gap and implementation of culturally responsive strategies, significant progress progress can be made in closing the achievement gap between white and minority students in the English language classroom. So she's left us with a very good closing sentence. Like I said, I would like to see a few more specifics in here about what's going to go into your curriculum, but not too many. It only needs to be maybe one paragraph, okay? All right, let us go on down and look at the re resources or the references. Please notice that they are in alphabetical order by last name of the author. And all the authors are in the first place. Always find an author or find the organization that wrote it. But do not put the title of the article first. And then, of course, publication date. And if the publication is um, from a journal or a magazine, very often they will have a month there, like Callahan J, 2019, comma, August 19th. Okay, and all of the journals need to be in italics, but you do not have to put quotation marks around them. Okay, thank you for listening, and I do hope that this helps. Look at the example, use it as your format, and you can make sure that you have met the requirements. Thank you, and have a great day.